On this episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, Beverly Hills, known for its swimming pools and movie stars, to quote a television show from the 60s, but also for high-profile celebrity scandals and murders. So there were nine shots that rang out. Four actually struck Bugsy. Uh, One went through the right eye and out the left eye. One went through his cheek and two went through the chest area. And to actually do that kind of shooting, uh, you would actually have to have two uh, people doing the shooting, one doing the headshot and one doing the body shot. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. I am Eric Rivenis. Great to have you here. So delighted today to have as my guests investigative reporter Barbara Schroeder and Clark Fogg, just recently retired senior forensic specialist for the Beverly Hills Police Department. They are co-authors of Beverly Hills Confidential, A Century of Stars, scandals, and murders. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. So my first question for you is, how did you come to collaborate on this book together? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, a good, it's a good backstory. Um, I went into the Beverly Hills Police Department and talked to the police chief at the time, Dave Snowden. I wanted to do a documentary on a case, uh, Ronnie Chase, and she was the publicist who had been shot and killed. And there were a lot of questions that the media had. And so I talked to Dave Snowden and I said, hey, yeah, let's work together on the documentary. And he said, no chance, no comment. <laughs> so <laughs> he said, but he said, I want you to talk to somebody who can maybe answer some of your questions. He also is the department historian. So I thought I was just going to meet Clark for a couple of minutes, but then. Needless to say, three hours later. <laughs> we, one, uh, parking, one parking ticket, I might add, that I couldn't get fixed. <laughs> well, that, that that's how we get our, our income in Beverly Hills. We look out for reporters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you guys hit it off pretty easily then. Yeah, and just the fact that, you know, Clark was the keeper of the history of the Beverly Hills Police Department and was, and, it, and we have to, we kind of have to give credit to the chief, right, Clark? For Oh, yeah, most definitely. The chief has been instrumental in trying to save the history of the PD. Uh, when he came on um, 11 years ago, uh, I think it was 2004, uh, he obtained uh, the cold case of um, Bugsy Siegel. And he found it to be in shambles. It was just in like an accordion case. And uh, he approached me and knew that I was interested in history. And the two of us uh, started preserving the history throughout the department. And uh, so we have to, I have to give him quite a bit of credit uh, in trying to save cases and also trying to tell the stories that have been lost uh, over these many decades. Our department started... Pretty much a city of Beverly Hills started in 1906. It, before it was called Beverly Hills, it was called the uh, Rodeo Land and Water Company. And uh, with just a marshal who was just there just to watch out for poaching in the area. And uh, little by little, it grew into uh, a city that has been known for its celebrities and uh, and for many other notable people. And uh, it has just flourished since uh, 1906. 1914, it actually became a, a uh, incorporated city, and uh, the history goes on from there. So there's, well, it, there's tons of history in that area. And one of the first big cases that I think every journalist in and around Beverly Hills in Los Angeles was always interested in was this big murder mystery back in 1927 that happened at the Greystone Mansion. And 
when I walked into Clark's office and he showed me the his, the little history department, which was like a private little area, he took me in there and I saw like, they call it the murder book. There it was a white uh, plastic binder and it said Greystone Mansion on it. And I said, hey, Clark, can I look at that? And then we, uh, I think, I hope you, you found that I really was there for the love of history at that point because, you know, and, and solving some cases that were, were unsolved. And then we got, it was, I, I think it was unprecedented. I had never, as a, as a reporter, I had never had that kind of willingness and access to police files and records that um, we were able to, to have thanks to Chief Snowden. And then, you know, Clark and I thought, we're so interested in this and let's see if we can't, you know, look up some old evidence. Like Clark had stuff from Bugsy Siegel from the case, from, from the, the, you know, the case file. And Clark, Clark, you had the, like some bullet shards. I remember. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we actually have uh, Bugsy Siegel's wallet contents, um, the many reports that were uh, filed during uh, the time. So there, there were a lot of uh, uh, old cases um, uh, that were just put into the file and pretty much forgotten. And uh, Barbara and I wanted to actually um, uh, relive those cases and tell their story in order for these people uh, could, they could actually be heard in a, a book form per se. Let me, let me put it that way. And all these cases that have been forgotten, uh, we shed some light onto them. And I looked at certain cases and kind of told my opinion on some of the cases that uh, had, um, like the Bugsy Siegel case, that it was considered a cold case, uh, but it is now closed. And uh, some other cases, you know, the Lana Turner, Johnny Stompanato death case that that occurred, and there's all these cases that that have occurred uh, throughout the decades. I started in 1982, so I uh, I handled a lot of cases, a lot of the murder cases and death cases from 1982 on. And, well, yeah, so, that brings up the Menendez case. That's where I inadvertently met Clark. I didn't know it at the time that we would work together in the future, but he was on the stand in, in that case. And I was covering the, the case and being able to interview Clark all these years later and get the inside story of how, what happened when he walked in to the Menendez home and what he immediately sensed, it was fascinating to have access to that. And Clark, do you want to tell the story of what, how, when you walked in there, what, what it was like with your umbrella? Oh, sure. Yeah. It, unfortunately, uh, uh, that was a case, um, that occurred, um, of two brothers murdering their parents, uh, on, in Beverly Hills one late night, um, in August. And, uh, it was just a shame. 1989 was the year and we were called to the house. Uh, two brothers, uh, came home and discovered their parents shot death, uh, shotgun death, in the den area. And, uh, my job was to, uh, photograph and collect evidence and to actually put together the crime, uh, scene, uh, along with two other detectives, we, we acted as a team and it was a pretty bloody, uh, crime scene. Uh, Mr. Menendez, who was located on the couch was shot, uh, numerous times with a shotgun close range, uh, approximately seven times with a, a double odd buck and his wife um, Kitty Menendez was located on the floor directly below him near a coffee table and she was shot in excess of 11 times with a shotgun so it was a as you could imagine it was a very gruesome case the uh, the area throughout the whole den was covered in body parts and uh, blood t- tissue uh, you teeth in fact, it was so bloody that uh, a, a, a helper, a, another detective, had to hold an umbrella over my uh, head in order for the parts not to fall on me while I was photographing them. That's how bloody it was. So, um, well, you know, we have. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. We, as the media, we didn't have a clue as to who the suspects might be, other than it might have been a bad business deal. So, here's what Clark thought when I mean, you had you had a sense, right? Right when you walked in. Yeah, it, you could tell that the that the two brothers had uh, more information than uh, 
they were telling us. In fact, at one point I asked uh, Lyle Menendez, um, who was the older of the brothers, to I asked him to enter the house so I could fingerprint him uh, and use his fingerprints as an elimination. And he made a spontaneous statement to me indicating as we entered the house, he said, is that where uh, my parents are? And I looked at him and I said, you're the one who discovered him. And you could tell at that point, it all started to fall apart. <laughs> and uh, from that night, uh, the detectives, uh, we all had a sense that the brothers had had more information and possibly could have even done the crime. And it took a, a good six months before we started making the arrest of both uh, Lyle and Eric uh, Menendez. I remember some of it. Um, th- that was on court TV, right? Yes, Yes, it was actually uh, two trials. The first trial ended up being a a mistrial, and we had to, um, uh, again, uh, try them. And uh, subsequently, it was a a guilty plea on both of them. They they ended up admitting to the murders, and um, they were claiming that uh, they were abused mentally and sexually. And uh, so they, they actually are doing life uh, in prison without the chance of parole. So, but um, there were many, many cases like that uh, throughout um, my time there in my career. Um, if it wasn't uh, you know, the kind of death investigations that we do, we, we respond to all death investigations, whether it be suicide, um, whether it be murder, whether it be uh, traffic accidents, we, we even responded to those. So um, we're a little different. We have a team of four uh, forensic specialists that go out to different crime scenes throughout uh, Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills is a very small community. It's 5.6 square miles. And uh, we have approximately 140 officers. We have a nighttime population of 34,000, but then a daytime population, it could uh, soar to 250,000 to 500,000, depending upon what day it is. So we have a a daytime population and a nighttime population with a lot of influx of of different personalities that... uh, that go on there. Um, when you have money, you have <laughs> you have uh, certain types of crimes that that are associated with um, you know the area that uh, you police. So we get a lot of robberies, a lot of burglaries. Uh, some of the murders that we don't get too many murders uh, in Beverly Hills. Usually, it averages about uh, two to three a year, uh, but they are they tend to be uh, a whodunit. Uh, type of uh, of a crime. They're not like drive-by shootings or things like of that nature. I would imagine it's um, usually the CEO of this company or the daughter of this millionaire, a, a lot of these types of murders. Uh, yes, you get uh, quite a bit of who's who in the industry. That's how I met Barbara with uh, the Ronnie Chasen. Ronnie Chasen was the publicist for Cher, and who was she was on her way home from a uh, premiere of burlesque and uh, she was actually gunned down in beverly hills right off of sunset and uh, so that's um a murder mystery that uh created quite a bit of sensation because uh information that a person uh was riding a bike um and also committed the murder. And there was a lot of misinformation that went on. And uh, a lot of press had questions relating to uh, how a person on a bike could have committed a murder from someone who was driving a car. So there were a lot of dissecting of the case that had to be done. And it ended up being the person did actually ride a bike to the location where she was shot. He actually parked his bike in the uh, park and was sitting by waiting for someone to walk by he discovered this person who was alone in her car in the early morning hours i think it was around one o'clock in the morning she was waiting to turn left and he took the advantage of the person being alone in the car waiting for a left turn signal and he approached the car and uh, pulled out a gun and tried to rob her and I believe there were some words going back and forth and he ended up shooting through the window 
on the passenger side approximately four times, striking her in the chest and back area. And then she, she took off in the car and ended up um, down the street and going into a light post. And people thought she was drunk when, they, when the car uh, struck the light post. And, and uh, yeah, and this was a case early on when we heard about it in the media. Uh, there was a lot of there, we had a lot of questions. The police department wasn't really saying much. I think there was maybe one, maybe two uh, press conferences. So I went into the police department with a with you know real questions like, wait, what do you mean somebody on a bike came up? And it, a lot of it didn't make sense. So Clark was very patient, took me through you know the steps and. And then uh, we we unearthed and I, and I found some stuff online that this suspect um, Harold Smith was his name right Clark correct mm-hmm. yeah he had uh, two things that convinced me that okay we there were a few conspiracy theories floating around you know that she had some bad connections somebody might you know bad business deals two things that convinced me that it wasn't the conspiracy theories was number one. I found video online of a family, a mother and a daughter that had been walking in Beverly Hills a few years earlier. And this Harold Smith came up to them on a bike and held a knife to them. So that was, you know, that was the prior behavior right there. And, and the other bit of information was that Ronnie Chasen, um, a few weeks prior had, um, been driving along Sunset Boulevard and some young girls in a van had kind of cut her off and she kind of nudged them over to the side of the road and she was yelling at them and screaming at them. So she had exhibited some signs of road rage. And I think that, you know, that may have been part of what, you know, exacerbated the situation that if this guy is, was walking in front of her car, telling her to get out of the car or she wanted him to get out of the way, who knows, we'll never know. But, you know, if she was yelling at him and then she rolled down her window a little bit um, to, to yell at him, that, you know, maybe that, you know, instigated or incited something that could have been avoided. So there, maybe there lies a lesson in, in this horrible tragedy. But also it was Clark who found out that the, the information about the, her window being open. And I had never heard that reported before. And there's a theory in all my years that I've heard that there's a hidden Mickey in every case. Um, in Disneyland, there are little hidden Mickey Mouses and the kids can look for them, apparently, the hidden Mickeys. And um, a, a, an officer a long time ago told me that every case has its hidden Mickey. And it, Clark, it was the open window. Yeah, there there was an... Um she was driving from the W Hotel, which was located in Hollywood. And um, along the sunset, she was calling herself to make notations of what she needed to do the next day. Um, and she called some other people. And we we actually listened to those phone calls and we did not hear. Um, she had her window on her driver's side down approximately two inches uh, when we Uh, found her in the car. Uh, We did not hear that wind. If you have your car window open, you would hear the wind coming through. We did not hear that. So that was opened after she made those phone calls and probably was uh, at the left turn signal. And uh, she was probably conversing with uh, Harold, the suspect, uh, when the shooting occurred. So I'm thinking that he came and approached the car and said, you know, give me your purse, give me your car. She rolled down the window and was yelling at him, uh, get out of the way. She may have even lurched forward. This is all speculation. And uh, he got ticked off and actually fired through the window and uh, striking her four times. So there, there is all these cases, um, you know, the, the pr- uh, press got a hold of this. They were calling it a conspiracy theory that uh, it was a hit. Yeah, and a lot of times um, you have to look at the evidence that you have. Uh, you, you have to just handle one piece of evidence at a time and then disprove uh, the piece of evidence that you have or, or don't have. <laughs> Sometimes it, it could be both ways. And uh, in this case, uh, it was very uh, evident that uh, this was not a a hit of per se, especially in the area that she was found, the area that it happened. Um, you know, 
and uh, it actually was just a terrible um, opportunist who was probably waiting on the um, on the sidewalk near some bushes, probably waiting for someone to walk by as they walk their dog to rob them like he did those two ladies, uh, the mother and daughter, uh, years before. I mean, that's what he was known for. He, he was a homeless person. He um, actually uh, stole the weapon that he used. And uh, so there's all these different um, uh, situations that come up and uh, from his past history of him committing burglaries in Beverly Hills and what we had seen at the at the crime scene itself uh, it all indicated that it was a, a crime of opportunity and he tried to uh, either take the vehicle or probably wanted her purse uh, for the money but um, you know it, it with the CSI, uh, I call it the CSI syndrome that's out there. You know, we have all these CSI programs. We have all these, uh, you know, um, 48 hour shows and all these crime episodes. Uh, you know, a lot of people end up becoming uh, armchair uh, CSI people. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, you have to actually view the crime scene in its entirety and actually be at the scene and to understand what you're seeing. And also um, going to other crime scenes um, helps you solve the crime scene that you are currently investigating. So it, it takes years of, of going to different types of crime scene scenes before you actually um, uh, could start um, interpreting what you're seeing. Oh, fascinating. So a lot of Beverly Hills history is tied to Hollywood. That's where a lot of the silent film stars moved during the early years of Hollywood. Yeah, Mary, Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks, they had a, he had a house and he had a secret passageway to his house that she could sneak into while they were both with other people. Did you say Mary Pickford? Yeah, Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks. They had one. Of the yeah. They had a um, a hunting lodge. Uh, you know, Beverly Hills was very, um, it wasn't as you see it today. Every single tree that you see in Beverly Hills, and there are uh, tens of thousands of trees, every one of those trees had to be planted there. Uh, it almost looks like an oasis today, but back then it was just bean fields and just, um, you know, rolling hills. And Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford had a hunting lodge called Pickfair and uh -huh. back in 1919. And they would go there and eventually they transformed that hunting lodge into a beautiful estate called Pickfair. And uh, when they moved there, uh, they were the talk of the town because it was Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. <laughs> and everybody wanted to come to Beverly, Hill Beverly Hills. And you started having uh, Charlie Chaplin coming in. You had um, a number of, of like Albert people. Einstein and Charles Lindbergh. They, they called it the the White House of the West for a while. Oh, interesting. I was surprised that Mary Pickford was the victim of a kidnap plot. Yes, and it was. I'll tell you what was fascinating. Clark and I, uh, whenever we would find a story, because there were so many we could have included, but we just you know picked the cream of the crop. And for example, like in the, in the Mary Pickford story, we would go in order to find visual support because we have a lot of great photos in the book as well that I had never seen before, but are fascinating. Clark and I, we would go to libraries. We went to the local paper. We went into their archives that we were in the basement, like wearing white gloves and masks. So we wouldn't, you know, pre, way pre-pandemic, but so that we wouldn't, you know, hurt anything with our the oils on our, on our fingers. And we were able to get some really great photos, um, including, you know, the one where Mary Pickford, where there had been a, a, an attempt on to kidnap her. One of the early tabloid crimes in, in Beverly Hills that you cover had to do with a pair of ill-fated lovers named Dolly and Otto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you tell us that story? The lover, the secret attic lover. <laughs> yeah. This is a great story. And we were so happy to find, not happy to find, but we were glad there was a Beverly Hills connection because it started off actually uh, like in Hollywood, but it was this woman, she was, 
Dolly A. Strike. She was married to the guy, a guy who had, he made his fortune manufacturing aprons. So he'd go off to work. She was bored at home. And one of the employees that she had a crush on would come over to help her. Um, and then she actually, I can't even believe this happened back then. She stashed him in a secret room in the attic so that the two of them could play house together when her husband was off at work. And then eventually she got found out and, and it was, and there's a great photo in the book where um, you have all these guys in a suit and then the, her lover is like kneeled down is kneeling down at the entryway to a tiny door where he would hide all day. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking about 1922. We're not talking yeah. about last year. <laughs> so. That's great. Right. He was like a, a typewriter repairman or something like that. He was, he was, uh, he fixed the sewing machines at the company. Oh, yeah. sewing machines. Right. So, and then, and so, as we said in the book, suddenly Dolly needed a lot of repairs on her sewing machine. <laughs> That's how she justified that. <laughs> so I would love it if you could talk more about the Great Stone Mansion case. This is the one you first heard about when you met Clark, right? No, I had actually, when I, when I moved to Los Angeles back in 1990, um, one of the first things I did was uh, go look around to see what the you know, landmarks of the area were. And one of them was Greystone Mansion. And then I learned that there had been a, a murder there. And it's a, it's a, it's an incredible story because Greystone Mansion was the second largest residence in the state of California next to Hearst Castle back when it was built. And it was built by this respected at the time oil man, Edward Doheny Sr. But he built it for his son who was married and had three or four kids. Um, and within a few months of moving in, this son, Ned Doheny um, Jr., he was found dead next to his male secretary, who was also someone who had kind of overseen the estate as it was being built. So it, it just surrounded by, you know, so many theories and how is it that this son of this wealthy um, oil man um, was killed? Was he killed? Was it murder-suicide? And it was interesting because the Greystone Mansion every year they at Christmas time they put on a an event where decorators come in and they decorate each room differently to show off their decorating style and there's always an interesting decoration or room style in what they call the murder room the murder room where um, the two men were found actually one was found in the hall and um, there's a great backstory to it to it as well Clark about the whole you know secret funding possibly for an oil deal. Oh yeah. This goes back. So we're talking, um, uh, back February 16th, 1929. So, uh, this, this goes back, uh, many, many decades and 1929, you had this huge mansion. We're talking, the mansion now belongs to the city of Beverly Hills. It's used as a, uh, a park and the home is used for special events. So you could go there today and visit uh, the mansion and the grounds. They have beautiful grounds. Uh, the house is over 50,000 square feet. The walls are actually two feet thick in some areas. And uh, there were many, many movies that were filmed there. I mean, it, we have everything from um, National there Treasure <laughs> to uh, um, There Will Be Blood. Uh, you know, it, it, there's all these different movies that were filmed up there. Unfortunately, this was also the, the area of, uh, of Ned Doheny, which was the son of Mr. Doheny and Ted Plunkett, who was the secretary to Ned Doheny. And actually, Ted um, was the secretary who actually helped build the, the mansion. And there's a bedroom of Ted who is, uh, the bedroom is located in the first floor on the west wing area of the residence. And that's where um, the, the murder took place. That's where uh, Ned Doheny was shot in the temple. And then immediately outside the hallway door, uh, Ted Plunkett was found with a self-inflicted gunshot to the head. And throughout the decades, there were many, many stories that the Secret Service killed them, <laughs> that there were, that the two the lovers. Lovers, um, lovers, yeah. Yeah, there were many, many. Uh, the biggest story is that uh, 
Ned and Ted were involved in the Teapot Dome scandal uh, back in the day, and that they had to testify in front of Congress and regarding uh, the Teapot Dome scandal. And which Ned- really quickly, that was an oil leasing scandal. Ed Doheny Sr., the father, um, was an oil man, and he was trying to get special privilege from the government. So he was able to lease some property in in, in uh, Wyoming, and that's why they called it the Teapot Dome Scandal. And he was on the hook for that, but he was bribing people. And maybe Ned and Ted Plunkett were helping to transport the money that Ed Sr. was um, – was giving to the government officials. Maybe the two young men were, you know, transporting the money to the government. That's a long-winded explanation, but it was a scandal. <laughs> so. yeah, it, it actually was uh, Ned and Ted bringing $100,000 to the Secretary of the Interior for oil rights. And they were going to have to testify. And in a short story of the of the murder, um, Ted, the secretary, was going to be blamed for for this, and uh, this occurred over many weeks. But the pressure started building on him. He was being pressured uh, by a number of people to take the fall for it. He didn't want that, so he actually came to the mansion one night and threatened Mister Doheny, Ned Doheny, um, and said he was not going to be taking. He was not going to be the fall guy f- for the scandal. And he had a, he actually went upstairs into the gun room. They had a gun room where they would check out weapons and go hunting in the area because that whole area uh, north of the mansion was the hunting grounds for uh, the Doheny estate. And uh, they, he retrieved a revolver and took it to the bedroom area where Ned was at and they had a discussion and sometime during the discussion, the weapon accidentally went off and struck Mr. Doheny in the temple area. It was a through and through shot. It entered through the left temple, exited out the right temple and into the wall. And when uh, Ted discovered what he had done, he panicked And he left the bedroom. As he was leaving the bedroom, he turned around and saw Mrs. Doheny and the and a doctor who was called uh, to uh, respond to the to the mansion because they knew that uh, Ted was not in his right mind at the time. And as they were approaching Ted in the hallway, uh, Ted slammed the door. Actually, looked at them and said, "Don't come in here. I did something really bad." and slammed the door, and then he took the gun and shot himself in the temple. On page 29 of our book, you could actually see the two bodies, one located in the bedroom and the other located in the hallway. Um, and th- the good thing about the book is, uh, and I think Barbara may have mentioned, th- this is the first time uh, that a lot of these pictures throughout the whole book uh, um, have been published. So we got special permission from the police chief and the city to, to actually... Um, go through all these cases and uh, and get special permission to actually publish uh, a book so these cases would not be forgotten. But we, we actually tell the story and we, through uh, different types of, of uh, through my crime scene uh, knowledge and through Barbara's uh, excellent uh, investigative reporting, we actually tell the story and dissect it and, uh, and show what the possibility of, of the story of that particular story was uh, along with the others in the book. So we go through, we, we pretty much had 10 uh, stories per decade and we, that we tried to tell. And that, that was one of the big, big cases of the 1920s was the, the Doheny murder of 1929. Are there any cases that you were able to go back and re-examine and come to a new conclusion? Yeah, it probably the uh, the um, I don't know which, which case do you think probably the Bugsy Siegel case yeah. would probably be uh, <clears throat> one of the premier cases that everybody has heard about just because they've made uh, a number of movies about Bugsy Siegel. But uh, that was one that uh, it was originally thought that it was a lone shooter that committed that crime. Yeah, and this was, a, sorry for interrupting, but this was such a great moment because Clark had evidence that he had, you know, old evidence. He had bullet shards from Bugsy Siegel's gun and he has this, you know, 
fancy CSI lab. So Clark did everything he, that he does so well. And, you know, all these years, it's still, they never for sure said who killed Bugsy Siegel. There are a lot of theories on that too. But all these years we've been thinking it's just been one person. And I'll never forget when I walked in the office and Clark said, hey, I think I know what happened. And it was a great moment and we're going to reenact it for you now. So Clark, what happened? <laughs> no, we, they have to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you know, in that case, we had uh, a number of eight by 10 photos and through the investigation, um, you had Bugsy Siegel. This was back in 1947 when Bugsy Siegel was, uh, actually executed in Virginia Hill's house. Virginia Hill lived on a uh, Linden drive and she was a, a well-known actress at the time. And he just, um, came in from Las Vegas and mysteriously, Virginia Hill was told not to be home during that time frame. And uh, it would be much healthier for her to be away from the house. And around midnight, shots rang out uh, and Bugsy Siegel was found uh, shot to death on the couch on the first floor of the living room. Uh, when you look at the photos, uh, there was always uh, speculation that it was uh, a shooter uh, that used um, a 30 carbine uh, weapon. And when I looked at the photo, uh, we had a photo uh, of the driveway next door. And the driveway had nine uh, cartridge cases um, in the driveway. So there were nine shots that rang out. Four actually struck Bugsy. Uh, one went through the right eye and out the left eye. One went through his cheek and two went through the chest area. And to actually do that kind of shooting, uh, you would actually have to have two uh, people doing the shooting, one doing the headshot and one doing the body shot. And when you actually look at the eight by tens of where the shell casings are, you actually see two groupings. So what happens when you fire the weapon, uh, the shell casing will uh, get ejected out of the weapon. And you can actually see a grouping of like about five shell casings and then a, another separate uh, grouping of uh, four shell casings. And they're far apart, which indicate that there were two weapons involved uh, because you, you're not going to be moving. You're not going to take aim at someone and then uh, move to another location and fire again. So uh, I actually told Barbara, most likely uh, the two individuals approached uh, the driveway, shot through the window uh, from the driveway. And I could uh, just imagine one said, you take the head, I'll take the torso. And, uh, and the two, uh, the gunshots rang out. There was actually even... As we started reading uh, reports, uh, people indicated that there were two vehicles that pulled up and people got out. But, you know, there was speculation at the time. But uh, again, looking at the different shell casings, where they are, the cartridge cases, it all indicates um, without even having those reports of someone uh, two cars coming up and two people possibly getting out, just having the physical evidence tells me that there were two shooters. Well, and then interestingly, we found a photo in one of the newspaper archives of a few weeks later, two Tonys were found dead in a car, Tony Brancato and Tony Branzino. And most likely it could have been them. So, and, and also we were also able to find these really great old headlines in the newspapers that you would not find duplicated today. The, there was much more freedom in writing headlines. And I want to share one with you. From the Daily News, the day after you know Bugsy was killed, it said, Bugsy had too much lead in his head to get up off the couch that night. <laughs> right? What a goofy headline. But that's, you know, so you, you find, uh, you know, things that you, like that that couldn't possibly be duplicated today. You know, what would have been better is he had too much lead in his head to get out of bed. <laughs> It wasn't Dr. Seuss writing that one. Right? Rhymes a lot better, right? But uh, th that definitely wouldn't fit the crime scene very well. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well. yeah, I don't think we have to worry about giving too much away because you have 
so many stories in this book, far too many for us to cover today. Uh, and people will have plenty to discover on their own uh, when, when they buy your book. Um, there is one thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, Barbara. When we were exchanging emails, you told me in one something that piqued my curiosity. You said that there is one story in the book that you and Clark disagree on. And I'd really like to know what it is, uh, what that big fight you are having is all about. <laughs> you, well, you, mean, so, you, you mean me telling Barbara she's wrong in that story? <laughs> and, and me telling Clark that my intuition has solved this case? No. <laughs> well, no, because for the most part, Clark and I really gravitated towards the same stories. And there were a lot that I hadn't heard of and that Clark had gravitated towards, like Lupe Velez. There was a, a suicide mystery there. There, uh, there was a bank robbery involving a borrowed baby. And there were, I mean, there were so many, even current cases like Mark, the actor Mark Ruffalo's brother um, had been killed. And there were all these cases and we were, we were in agreement on all of them and we wanted to investigate them and work together as, you know, reporter and investigator. And we were doing a great job until we got to the Lana Turner case. And then Barbara yeah. found out that she was wrong on that. <laughs> so, and, 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 and I just felt so bad for Barbara. So, well, was, <laughs> Oh, sorry, it Barbara. Case, it was a case in 1958 for people who aren't familiar with it. And I became familiar with it because I was working on this book. But she was a beautiful actress that my, my parents had talked about her, right? That she was this great actress. And she took a lover, a gangster, bad guy named Johnny Stampanato. And um, she was just slated to go to the uh, Academy Awards, and she wasn't going to take Johnny with her. And Johnny Stampanato got kind of mad, like, oh, I'm good enough to hang out with and have a relationship with, but, you know, my reputation is such that you're not going to take me to the Academy Awards. And so they fought a lot, and his and Lana's mother called up the police chief at the time and said, hey, well, how do we stop this guy from harassing my daughter? Well, longish story short, a little a week or so later, um, he is, Johnny Stampanato is found dead in Lana Turner's bedroom on a white carpet. And the story goes that her daughter, Cheryl, um, had heard her parents, heard them arguing. She went, Cheryl went to the kitchen, got a knife, came to the door. Johnny Stampanato opens up the door. Lana's daughter, Cheryl is standing there with a knife that she got from the kitchen and the knife is plunged or ends up in Johnny Stampanato and he died. So that's how the story played out that the daughter killed him. She was acquitted because it was self-defense of her mother. And um, Clark has a different opinion. I do. I have the right opinion. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I believe that Lana, I believe that Lana Turner is the one that actually, um, killed Johnny Stampanato. Uh, you have to look at what pr uh, transpired before this, uh, the crime. And what had happened was, um, you know, the relationship started in 1957 and it was a very uh, contentious relationship. Uh, they, they fought a lot. And uh, in fact, um, you know, in London, they were filming uh, another time, another place with Sean Connery. And Johnny Stampanato uh, came to London and they got into a lot of fights and uh, I mean, physical fights to a point that um, that Johnny Stampanato strangled Lana Turner and Sean Connery uh, interfered with that. And in fact, Johnny Stampanato pulled out a gun and Sean Connery took it away from him and so there was a, this was a very physical relationship uh, in the bad sense of the, of the word. And um, it came down to um, Friday, April 4th, uh, which was Good Friday. And he came to the house. And because of this contentious relationship, I think she was very fearful because he actually threatened to actually carve Lana Turner's face up and her legs. Her legs were insured by Lloyd's of London for uh, a hefty amount. <laughs> and, uh, and she was a very big star at the time. And um, she was actually being threatened by this mobster. I mean, he was the hitman for Mickey Cohen. Uh, you're talking about a, a really bad guy. He was a bodyguard for Mickey Cohen. And some people uh, actually called him uh, the hitman for Mickey Cohen. 
you know, at age 32, he was uh, approached Lana Turner and decided to, uh, uh, I think they got physical. I think uh, Lana Turner had a knife in the bedroom as uh, protection. And I believe the, the argument got to a point and uh, she stabbed him in the abdomen and he it just hit at the right spot. He bled out uh, right there on the bedroom floor. Um, I don't think anybody runs into a knife. Uh, it, the knife actually has to be plunged into him. And when you look at the height of, of how the weapon uh, was plunged into him, I think that the daughter, uh, Cheryl Crane, took the blame for it because a 15-year-old was not going to be prosecuted for the murder. And I think that took a lot of the a lot of the pressure off of, you know, if you have the mob um, and you just killed the the um, hitman for, for the mob, uh, they would probably get angry with Lana Turner, but they would not get angry with Lana, uh, Lana Turner's daughter, Cheryl. Well, and I think, Go ahead, finish. I, I just feel that uh, just looking at the evidence and looking at the story and uh, that running to the kitchen and picking up a knife and running all the way back. Um, there, there's just too many holes in that. Uh, uh, no pun intended. <laughs> but, uh, um, I, I believe that, uh, that Cheryl Crane was the innocent, um, daughter. I think, uh, she, there was actually some love letters going back and forth with Cheryl Crane and Johnny Stompanato. I think she, love letters, though. They they could have been, but we don't know for sure. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, they were tinged. And, actually, awkward yeah. and, and they actually appeared. Uh, and Mickey yeah. Cohen, Mickey Cohen is the one who actually provided those letters to the police department, yeah. which, we, which was a very interesting uh a turn of events. But um, looking at that, uh, I have my theory. Barbara has her. I respect her theory. Well, um, and, but um, and I, I respectfully, believe- Here's why I respectfully disagree, because I called Cheryl Crane. We did follow ups on all of these stories where it was possible. Um, so I called Cheryl Crane. She's now a real estate agent in uh, or she was at the time when I called her a real estate agent in Palm Springs. And we had a long conversation and she wrote a book and she continues her story of, yeah, she's the one who did it. So in my mind, um, she had no reason to, if, if it was her mother, she had no reason to keep telling that story. Um, she could have absolved herself completely. And also I'm not sure that a mother would allow her daughter to be tainted with that kind of a crime at the age of 14. I just can't imagine that a mother would allow that to happen and say, yeah, sure, honey, you take the blame for this. So let alone a 15, I think she was at the time, right? So I just, my instincts tell me that um, that it was it was Cheryl who held the knife and that he ran into it. But it, it, so we respectfully disagree with one another. We'll never totally solve that case. But I love the last line that we used in the book where, uh, uh, one of the detectives um, who was looking into this case, he said, in, in my opinion, Cheryl did society a favor in disposing of Stampinato. So there you go. That's how that story ended. Interesting. So I'd like to ask you about another one, especially compelling to me. Uh, Jean Harlow's husband's suicide. First, can you tell us who Jean Harlow was and who her husband, Paul Byrne, was, and the situation that led to his death. Yeah, she was, um, I would describe her as like the first platinum blonde bombshell in Hollywood, Jean Harlow's. And she went from bride to widow in eight weeks. And she had married, she had you know flirted with, been in relationships with, had a lot of fast and loose love affairs. But she really fell in love with this guy named Paul Byrne, who was a studio executive, who's probably one of the last people you'd think she'd fall in love with because he was kind of nerdy and kind of, you know, studious. And she just adored him because he respected her. He didn't look at her as just this, you know, sexy play thing that the roles that she played um, with actors like, you know, Clark Gable. And um, so he romanced her. She fell in love with him. They got married. And eight weeks later, he was found dead in his mansion. 
And she had been staying with her mother at the time. And so there was a big mystery and the studio executives and the fixers, you know, they showed up practically, I think before the police, Clark, I think a couple of them showed up. Before yes, the uh, I, I, actually, the uh, studio head showed up, and uh, there were a number of people that showed up. Yeah, and it turns out it, it, it most likely was his, that Paul Byrne had a, a wife, uh, kind of a common law wife in New York who had had some mental issues, and he had her stashed away at the Algonquin Hotel, and she was like this mystery reclusive woman who would walk around the halls, and then she would collect newspapers um, at the time that had headlines in them about Paul Byrne marries, you know, Hollywood actress Jean Harlow. So the theory is, is that she came out to to Beverly Hills and to, and, and to Paul Byrne's house. And be, it was because of the way that he was found. Um, and Clark was, again, some, you know, the person who shed light on this, um, that made us believe it wasn't a suicide, which is what the studio promoted, studios promoted at the time. And, you know, oh, he committed suicide because he couldn't uh, uh, keep his wife happy or, you know, a lot of different reasons. But the reason we think that it most likely was his wife who came out there. There were a couple of them, but Clark, you go ahead and talk about what you determined from this photo. I, I mean, there's just one photo of Paul Byrne in the hallway um, of the residence. And just that one photo, no one commits suicide in the hallway. Um, they, they I, I mean, just looking at that one photograph um, tells me that uh, uh, there's something wrong with the crime scene, whether it was staged or, but no one uh, commits um, suicide in that fashion and is found in that position. And uh, the, it, it just reeked of, uh, they, they call it in uh, even today staged crime scenes where you as an investigator enter a location and find certain things disarrayed. Uh, it could be fake ransacking. It could be uh, just recently an individual was found hanging uh, in the residence. Uh, when we when we got there, she was uh, cut down. And when uh, I uh, approached the body, just the um, the post mortem lividity that was appearing on the body was not correct. It indicated that the person was in a different location at the time of death, and put. Uh, in the location that she was in. So there is a lot that tells you right off the bat, hey, there's something wrong with this crime scene. Just like uh, going back to the Doheny murder, a lot of people have a problem when they look at the photos because they see Mr. Doheny with the blood going in one direction, and then all of a sudden the blood is going in a different direction. But if you read the reports, it shows that the doctor approached Mr. Doheny uh, and he was gurgling at the time and he rolled them over. And when you roll the body over, now the blood is going a different direction. So it, it's the same thing with Paul Byrne. It's the same thing with stage crime scenes. Uh, the individual who is staging the crime scene always does something wrong. And uh, it could be the minute uh, detail that is the telltale sign. It could be postmortem lividity. It could be uh, the way uh, the ransacking is. Certain ransacking, when you when you go to different burglaries all the time, you see uh, different things. And uh, in this situation, uh, uh, seeing Paul Byrne in the hallway, the note, the amount of people that were there beforehand, uh, it just raises a lot of concern. So the primary suspect, is it his wife, his mysterious wife, or, or someone else? We think the, the primary suspect was most likely his you know, secret reclusive wife that he had stashed away at this hotel because he still supported her. And it was very interesting because a few days after the, the death of Paul Byrne, his wife, Dorothy Millette, his common-law wife, was found dead. She had. She was on a boat that was headed back up. She was going back up to San Francisco where she'd been staying. She and her body had floated up to shore. She was on like a ferry, and uh, they also found her luggage. And in the luggage, one of the officers at the time, or detectives, found a notepad, and it looked like it had been written on. And he held it up to a mirror, and he saw the word justification. 
So that's a good closing scene for anybody who's going to do a movie about this. Story. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, you know, and there's always uh, telltale signs, you know, uh, the night that he was found, she was um, at his house. You know, and today we would be pulling video. We would be pulling DNA off of the body. We would be pulling. <laughs> there is quite a bit that we could be um, most likely, you know, in today's uh, CSI uh, evidentiary um you know, we can be collecting a lot of evidence that uh, these stories would not even be uh, as a whodunit uh, in in today's uh, fashion. Uh, but back then, the only thing we had were witness statements. We had notes. We had body locations. And thank God that um, we have photographs that the photographs could uh, help me as a crime scene uh, investigator reconstruct what I see in the photos, just like I did with the Doheny uh, murder and uh, uh, Paul Burns case and all these cases that we look at the uh, Bugsy Siegel case, we we can actually reconstruct uh, by way of the photographs and uh, could tell a whole different side of of the story that was never told. So why don't people kill themselves in hallways? I'm I'm curious now. <laughs> it, 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 I love it. <laughs> Uh, it's just a location that usually they're in a bedroom. They're located in uh, the living room on a couch. They're they're not found in that fashion um, uh, the way that he was found. A hallway is a transitional from one location to another. Um, it would be it would almost be like someone committing suicide at the front door. It, they don't, people don't do that. They want a private area. They want to be comfortable when they do it. They, <laughs> they're usually doing it in bathrooms. They're doing it in bedrooms. They're doing it in living rooms, but not in a hallway. Um, and there is one nice kind of a PF to this story because Jean Harlow, after Paul Byrne was found dead, um, Jean Harlow died shortly after two. She was only 26 and it was renal failure, but pri- it was five years after Paul Byrne died, but when uh, Paul's wife um, was found dead and then she was buried, didn't have a headstone, it was Jean Harlow who paid for a headstone for that woman. So that was kind of an interesting, you know, think about that for a minute, that she, uh, you know, she saw all the emotional aspects of what might have gone on and she was the one who, you know, Put that put that headstone on his on his wife's grave. The wife who may have murdered him. What do you make of the alleged uh, suicide note? That you know that it it didn't to me. I, and Clark can speak much more to this than I can. I've I've covered you know scenes, crime scenes that have turned out to be suicides. Clark is the one who has, actually has to go to them and you know do all his work there. But to me, as an investigative reporter, I read that note. And it, to me, it's, it was a short note and it was, I'll, I'll summarize it by saying, he was saying something like, I apologize for last night. It was just meant to be a comedy. That doesn't sound like a suicide note to me. Um, you know, so I don't know, Clark, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, it, it just did not, um, what was written in the note, um, how the note was uh, written, uh, it just, just did not have the appearance of a typical suicide note you would be going into a little bit more detail than what was written on the note. I would say that um, if we could have that note today and do DNA testing on that, we would have another person's DNA instead of Paul Burns. Hmm. So again, you tackle the history of Beverly Hills crime um, chronologically by decade. Um, just taking a step back, do you, do you see a pattern as, as time passed, did weapon type, uh, motives, uh, did they change, evolve over time? It, um, it's, Mark, yeah, you go first. Clark. Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting, if I may. Yeah, it, it's interesting. You have the dynamic of a rich community. You have the dynamic of money, death, <laughs> sex, scandals. Uh, you you name it, uh, it's it's going throughout the, um, the history of of stories doesn't change, the people change. And, uh, but with today's technology, we could help tell the story much more accurately today. And it's much harder to uh, 
to get um, um, to um, to actually cover up murder as we know it today with uh, GPS and vehicles, with surveillance, with phones that are attached to us. Um, makes it quite difficult. But uh, it seems like the crimes are, are, are consistent. Uh, it's just the people change, times have changed, technology has changed. And there is that added layer that crimes in Beverly Hills have that other cities don't, and that is the wealthy enclave. You know, you, you have people who have money to hide crimes. You have, you know, but you do see history repeating itself in that there are emotions that make people run hot, jealousy, um, you know, will cause people to do things. And that's what's interesting to see that over these decades, throughout the decades, um, you know, people kind of suffer from the same dramas and the same hardships. And and then Beverly Hills has the added layer of you've got that glitz and glamour and wealth and, you know, you need a you need a good de- good police department and uh, to help control some of these human urges and incidents because it happens everywhere. Right. Is there a case that you wanted to put in but didn't have room for? Or after the book was published, you came across and wished you had been able to include? Yeah, we have, we have, we started a list and, and we, you know, we can add to it at any time, but there was a great case. It's, and some of them you can find uh, short versions of that we didn't put in the book on our blog, beverlyhillsconfidential.org. Um, so there's some stories on there, but there, there's one, I'll give you a tease to it. it there was a big gold heist uh, going on, a, a, like a, a ring of people who were going to, and, and, and it's a, it's got this, the story has legs in that it goes, you know, to other countries. And so that was pretty fascinating. And we, we need to do a little more research on that and get all the, all the facts and all the, you know, all the characters together. Cause it's, it's sometimes it's hard to look up, you know, we're going into old, we're going into microfilm and, you know, going into libraries and old newspapers. And so it's a, it's, it's good detective work on, on both of our parts. And I'm glad, I'm glad Clark is there to lead us because he knows where all the bodies and stories are buried. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, but y- y- we have uh, even the uh, Lupe Velez when uh, w- the book was published, we found a photo of her, uh, the only known photo of her um, on the floor of her house. Yeah. And Eric, and- do you know the story, the Lupe Velez story? Yeah, I read it in your book, but if you wouldn't mind summarizing for my listeners, that would be great. She was like the Sofia Vergara of her day and was dramatic and beautiful and wonderful and great actress. And she got pregnant by an actor um, and she ended up, she didn't want to have this baby. She would, the way she was raised and her religion, she preferred to be, uh, you know, she didn't want to be an unwed mother and she killed herself. We're talking about 1944 and, uh, you know, so her roommate was Mary Astor and uh, at the time and the two of them shared the house and, you know, she she actually committed suicide by taking seconal tablets, about 70 of the tablets. So, you know, there's a lot of myths that go along with crime scenes and it's unfortunate because Barbara and I have uncovered um, a lot of facts that were printed that... um, uh, the facts were not facts. They were myths that became facts, uh, which is very dangerous when you're, when you're trying to tell a story or trying to investigate a story because these facts, these so-called facts become truths and they're not. And this was one that, um, was they, uh, there were stories that, uh, she created such an environment. Uh, she planned her own suicide. She dressed herself. She had flowers all around. And uh, uh, throughout my career, I have seen that uh, probably a half a dozen times where people kind of set their environment before they commit suicide. And this Lupe Velez did that. She created such a harmonious uh, going out party, per se. And a uh, myth has it that she was found with her head in the toilet, and that's not true. <laughs> and uh, even to this day, they they make fun of that that uh, that she created such a a great environment, and then she ended up uh, being found with her head in the toilet from throwing up. 
And uh, but in reality, she was found uh, in her room. Um, uh, she uh, died by uh, taking tablets, and um, it was an unfortunate romance with Harold um, Raymond, who uh, he was a French actor, and the romance broke off a week prior, and uh, and I think there was a lot of uh, unresolved conflict between both of them, and uh, it was unfortunate that she took her life uh, and the child's life, too. Left a suicide note behind too that said to, to her the, her baby's father that said Harold may God forgive you and forgive me too, but I prefer to take my own life away and our babies before I bring him in with shame. So that was you know that was pretty heavy. She also yeah. left a suicide note that mentioned her dogs and how nice she thought the press had been to her. And then we were able to, so for years, people thought she died with her head in the toilet. And there was a book, Kenneth Anger's um, Hollywood Babylon, which, you know, put that theory forth as well. And then we were able to find this photo thanks to Clark's connections. And um, it was a, you know, a file that had been not, not hidden away on purpose, but it just hadn't been looked at in a long time. And sure enough, you know, she did not die with her head in the toilet. She died in, in her home, and um, you, Clark was able to actually do measurements to find out how far she was from the door. Yeah, you want to talk about that a little bit, Clark? Yeah, just by looking at uh, the uh, the door uh, width and getting known measurements of, of things in the photograph, you could determine the height of the individual and doing facial recognition. And uh, it also helps that the photo had her name on the back. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, you, you never could rely on notes on the back of photos because they could always be mislabeled. But um, and that's what Barbara and, and uh, the, we both looked at these photos and start analyzing them. But I look at them in the sense of what can the photograph tell me um, and what information is available that is visible. And, uh, and then you go from there, um, and using a lot of computer programs that we have nowadays and doing measurements of known measurements of her photographs of her throughout her career as an actress. Thank God she was an actress because there are many photographs of her, uh, doing, uh, posing in different, uh, positions. So that all helped, uh, in doing a facial recognition. So. And determining that that photo we found that showed that yeah. she didn't die with her head in the toilet was in fact right. Lupe Bellas. Yes, it actually it actually uh, was found in a detective's file, uh, and the detective was over ninety five years old, and uh, it came back to the uh, to the department through his personal file that he had, and that was the only known photo. So, because a lot of these photos that uh, Barbara, we we found out that. Um, the department had disposed of a lot of the photos. And so our uh, goal in writing this book was not only to tell about these cases and to tell the stories of these people who have uh, come to the end of their life and their stories that were hidden. And we wanted to actually uh, kind of tell their stories and tell a little bit about the people and that they lived at one time. And this is how they died. And this is how uh, we determined that they, uh, they passed away and not by theory or some information that was wrongly uh, transposed years ago or even decades ago. So um, we were able to find these photos in archives uh, that are, some of them are online and others that are not. There were some, uh, there was one archive, the Watson archive um, in Glendale that was not online. We had to actually go there and search through, you know, thousands of, of files and photographs to determine um, yeah. years. We were, and, we, you know, we were able to match up. There was a Firestone kidnapping case where the, one of the heirs to the Firestone fortune, um, there were some pictures missing from that case uh, file for a long time. And we, we found them in that archive. And we were, the person who owned the archive didn't know that those photos matched a case that we were trying to solve and get, get photos for. So it was, it really, writing this book together, it, it was so unprecedented for me as a journalist to have cooperation and access, you know, to, to files like this and to be able to work with someone of Clark's 
you know, reputation. And I admire him even more now that I've seen how he works. And I, you know, for, for what it's worth, when you get people to work together, you know, the press to work with the police department, I mean, I, we really were able to do um, some really good work together. Whereas, you know, finding solve, not solving a lot of cases, but, so, you know, being able to put uh, you know, final chapters on a lot of these stories. And it's uh, something we highly recommend is when police departments and reporters work together. So are you both working on something new together now? We're always looking for a good story to solve together. Um, and yeah, so we're, we, you know, we, we, there are cases that we, you know, talk about and that, you know, we're also t- hoping to do maybe a, you know, a second volume or continue on our blog and, tell more good stories. Could you tell us more about your website and how to order your book? Yeah, so we have a few more stories and details on a lot of the stories in the book and some photos at uh, beverlyhillsconfidential.org. You can always get the book on Amazon. They have it there on online, and uh, or you could get the e-format book. And uh, by looking on our site, we always uh, add additional stories uh, as we find them, uh, like the Lupe Velez photograph. You'll see that. You'll see Mickey Cohen's uh, photograph of his car that he had, uh, the Cadillac that uh, he had armored uh, built in order to go around town. And <laughs> so there's uh, quite a bit of information that uh, we have online also. Well, thank you both so much for your time. This has been really awesome. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Again, I have been speaking to Barbara Schroeder and Clark Fogg. They are the authors of Beverly Hills Confidential, A Century of Stars, Scandals, and Murders. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.